Good evening. I'm Tim Bolton, Head of Programmes here at Dartington. And on behalf of everybody at Schumacher College in Dartington, I'd like to welcome you to this, our second talk in Series 2 of the online Joy of Six Schumacher College Earth Talks. And thank you all so much for supporting the work of Schumacher College. We've been holding Earth Talks for a number of years, face to face in the Old Poston and the Great Hall at Dartington. It's a fundamental part of our learning community, and we look forward to doing so again as soon as is practical. However, Schumacher College has a very long history of leadership, debate and research around our ecological and environmental catastrophe. And it feels important in this moment of global crisis that we reach out to our community and those in search of a new normal. As in previous talks, the audience appears to be joining us from across the globe. I'm in the far southwest of England on the border with Cornwall and our speakers are in Dartington and America. So although most of us are in some form of lockdown, the world feels increasingly interconnected and all of us increasingly interdependent. This talk is the second in this series of six which take place every Wednesday evening and which I hope you will also want to attend. If you're new to the Online Earth Talks, then all the previous talks are also available on Schumacher College's website, as is an archive of talks from the last few years. This series of talks are formed around the overarching theme, seizing the opportunity for radical transformation. Over the last four months... Okay, I found this on the web for this series of talks. Sorry, series and Siri, they get confused. Over the last four months, we have truly stepped into uncharted territory, simultaneously tragic, terrifying and exhilarating. Through COVID-19 and more recently the murder of George Floyd and the international Black Lives Matter response, we have witnessed both some of the best and the worst that mankind has to offer. And the divisions in our society have been brought into sharp focus. Many of the world's governments have made the kind of immediate, massive and radical changes to protect the well-being of their population, which completely invalidates their previously slow and cautious responses to our current societal and environmental degradation. This moment feels like almost anything is possible. So how do we resist squandering this opportunity and just return to normal or worse? So first, a few words about the format of the evening. In a moment, I'll hand over to Fritjof Capra to present his talk, which will take about 20 minutes. In a change to our advertised talk, we're also really pleased to announce that Fritjof will then be joined by Stefan Harding in conversation. We do want the session to be as accessible and interactive as possible. So please do use the chat button on the bottom of your screen to share thoughts with us and your fellow audience members and would welcome questions throughout using the Q&A link again at the bottom of the window. Fritjof and Stefan might respond to some of the questions as we go along, and I'll have a chance to put other questions to them during and at the end of the conversation. In total, we anticipate the session to last just about an hour. So let me start by introducing Stefan and Fritjof. Stefan Harding is one of the founding members of Schumacher College, where he has worked closely with James Lovelock, with whom he has maintained a long-lasting friendship and scientific collaboration. They were jointly appointed as founding chairholders of the Arne Nass Chair in Global Justice and the Environment at the University of Oslo. At Schumacher College, Stefan has taught alongside many of the world's leading ecological thinkers and activists, including Arne Nass, Brian Goodwin, Vandana Shiva, David Abram, James Lovelock, Lynn Margulis, and of course, Fritjof Capra. He is now the Schumacher College Deep Ecology Fellow. I also hear that it's Stefan's birthday, so happy birthday to you, Stefan. Fritjof Capra, PhD, physicist and systems theorist, is a founding director of the Center of Eco-Literacy in Berkeley, California, and a fellow of Schumacher College. Fritjof is the author of several international bestsellers, including The Tower of Physics and The Web of Life. He is co-author with Pierre Luigi Luisi, of the multidisciplinary textbook, The Systems View of Life. Fritjof also runs the Capra course, which is a fully online program based around the ideas contained in the Systems View of Life. And tonight, Fritjof is joining us from Berkeley, California. So over to you, Fritjof, and welcome back to Schumacher College and to Dartington. 
Thank you very much, Tim. I'm very happy to be able to participate in this series of Earth Talks here from my home in Berkeley, California. Uh, I well remember several Earth Talks I gave uh, at Dartington Hall and one in, in the town of Totnes. And I wish we all could be there together, but we'll do what we can. Uh, through this medium. So, um, as we all are well aware of, the coronavirus has resulted in a massive disruption of our daily lives, and its impacts are likely to lead to historical, social, and uh, political transformations. So, Tonight, I would like to share with you a systemic analysis of the COVID pandemic, which means an analysis that shows how its many aspects and dimensions are all interrelated. In my view, the coronavirus must be seen as a biological response of Gaia, our living planet, to the ecological and social emergency that humanity has brought upon itself. It arose from an ecological imbalance and it has dramatic consequences because of social and economic imbalances. During the last decades of the 20th century, humanity has exceeded the Earth's carrying capacity which means the number of people the biosphere can support without environmental degradation. World population has grown to 7.8 billion and the irrational obsession of our political and corporate leaders with perpetual economic growth has generated a multifaceted existential crisis threatening humanity's very survival. Now, scientists and environmental activists have warned of the dire consequences of our unsustainable social, economic, and political systems for decades. And of course, these issues have been discussed extensively at Schumacher College over the last 30 years. But until now, corporate and political leaders unable to break their intoxication with financial profits and political power have stubbornly resisted these warnings. Focusing their attention on short-term economic and political fluctuations, they disregarded the long-term impending catastrophic consequences. Now, however, our political and financial elites are forced to pay attention as the COVID pandemic brought the earlier warnings into real time. The clear cutting of large areas of tropical rainforest by multinational food corporations, relentlessly pursuing excessive growth and profits, as well as, as massive intrusions into other ecosystems around the world, have fragmented these self-regulating systems and have fractured the web of life. One of the many consequences of these harmful activities has been that viruses, which had lived in symbiosis with certain animal species where they caused no harm, jumped from those species to others and to humans where they are toxic and even deadly. So, for example, in the 1960s, an obscure virus jumped from a rare species of monkeys in West Africa to humans, and from there it spread to the United States, where it was identified as the HIV virus, causing the AIDS epidemic, which killed 39 million people over four decades. Similarly, the coronavirus jumped from a species of bats to humans in China, and from there it rapidly spread around the world. 
Now, one, when you watch the spread of the epi epidemic, it becomes clear that population density is a key variable for infection. And population density is often a consequence of excessive profit maximizing, whether on giant cruise ships or in other forms of mass tourism, in giant supermarkets, meatpacking factories, or in crowded living situations caused by social and economic inequality. Ecology has taught us that maximizing any single variable in a complex system will invariably lead to stress and vulnerability of the system as a whole. In previous time, these vulnerable social and cultural conditions were usually concealed by the corporate media. But now the coronavirus, which does not know any social boundaries, has laid them open. Biology trumps economics and politics. The role of social justice during a pandemic is particularly interesting. In normal times, the rich are relatively isolated from the poor. They live in their own neighborhoods, they have their own schools, hospitals, restaurants, clubs, and so on. So the fate of the poor does not affect them greatly. During a pandemic like COVID-19, the situation changes dramatically. Since the virus does not know any social boundaries, the fate of the poor can no longer be separated from that of the rich. <clears throat> the poor are much more susceptible to being infected because of crowded living conditions, lack of access to clean water, and especially in the United States, inadequate health care and social support. Sooner or later, they will infect also the rich because although they are separated socially, they're not separated biologically. There are numerous physical contacts between the rich and their personal assistants, drivers, delivery service, cleaning and maintenance staff, and so on. And through these physical contacts, the virus propagates and infects people uh, regardless of their social class. So during a pandemic, therefore, social justice is no longer a political issue of left versus right, but becomes an issue of life and death. To prevent the spread of pandemics now and in the future, it will be essential to improve the living conditions of the poor. More generally, ethical behavior that is behavior for the common good becomes an issue of life and death during a pandemic. Because a pandemic like COVID-19 can only be overcome by collective cooperative actions. Similar considerations apply to world population growth. Demographers have long known that the most effective means of curbing population growth are educating girls and enhancing the role and status of women throughout the world, ensuring their access to economic and political power and safeguarding their reproductive rights. Once again, we see that social justice goes hand in hand with ecological balance. When the pandemic spread around the world, one country after the other went into lockdown with only essential businesses remaining open and most people confined to their homes as we still largely are. As a consequence, transportation of people and goods decreased dramatically, supply chains were disrupted, businesses closed, the stock market collapsed and unemployment soared. So the worldwide health crisis 
has gone hand in hand with a worldwide economic crisis. Both of these crises have led to widespread tragic consequences for individuals and communities around the world. However, from a planetary ecological perspective, there have also been many positive consequences. As automobile traffic and industrial activities decreased dramatically, the pollution of major cities around the world suddenly disappeared within just a few weeks. And we are again enjoying clear skies and clean air. When I look out from my home office window over the San Francisco Bay to the city of San Francisco, it is clear in midweek where usually there is heavy smog. Now there's no smog at all. Wildlife is flourishing in ecosystems undisturbed by humans. As giant cruise ships no longer enter the Venetian lagoon and other tourists stay at home, the canals in Venice have become so clear that you can see fish again. In India, residents of Punjab are now able to enjoy a stunning view of the Himalayas, 200 kilometers away, which they have not seen for 30 years. The coronavirus has already been more effective in reducing CO2 emissions and slowing down climate breakdown than all the world's policy initiatives combined. Now, this does not mean that we want to stay in this situation. The current environmental regeneration has been the result of radically reduced human activities. But the same results can be achieved by radically changing human activities. The world's COVID response has shown us what is possible when people realize that lives are at stake individually during the pandemic and this also applies for life as a civilization during the uh, climate emergency. We know now that the world is able to respond with urgency and coherence once the political will has been aroused. With the COVID pandemic, Gaia has presented us with valuable life-saving lessons. The question is, will we have the wisdom and the political will to heed these lessons? And will we be able to apply them to the climate crisis? Will we shift from undifferentiated extractive economic growth to regenerative qualitative growth? Will we replace fossil fuels with renewable sources of energy for all our energy needs? Will we stop excessive mass tourism and instead revitalize local communities? Will we replace our centralized energy intensive system of industrial agriculture with organic, community oriented, regenerative farming? Will we plant billions of trees to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere and restore ecosystems so that viruses uh, will, uh, that are dangerous to humans will be confined again to animal species where they do no harm? We have the knowledge and the technologies to do all these things. Will we have the political will? Well, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind, to quote Bob Dylan. However, what we are seeing already is that corresponding social policies, which were unthinkable just a few months ago, are now being discussed seriously, seriously in various countries. Just a few examples. Denmark is paying 75% of the salaries lost by employees in private companies and 90% of lost revenue to self-employed people to help them through the crisis. Similarly, 
the UK is covering 80% of salaries. In the United States, the idea of a universal basic income, long considered a fringe idea, is now being discussed even by Republican politicians. Spain is nationalizing private hospitals. California is leasing hotels to shelter the homeless during the pandemic. The Green New Deal, already endorsed previously by some Democratic presidential candidates in the US, is now being discussed in the mainstream as a program of economic recovery. If we can catalyze global leadership to continue such social policies, and if we can add to them policies that respect and cooperate with nature's inherent ability to sustain life, we may not only overcome the COVID, COVID pandemic, but also succeed in stabilizing world population and the climate, nurturing local communities, and restoring the Earth's ecosystems. We may see CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere return to the safe level of 350 parts per million, and we may see climate catastrophes become rare, as they were in previous centuries. Looking back on 2020, future historians may conclude that even though the COVID pandemic had widespread tragic consequences for individuals and communities, in the long run, it may have saved humanity and large parts of the community of life from extinction. Well, those are my initial comments and uh, I very much look forward to engaging in discussions with you, uh, beginning with a dialogue with my good friend and colleague Stefan Harding, with whom I have co-taught many courses at Schumacher College. So uh, welcome, Stefan. It's uh, great to be with you again. Thank you, great job. And so uh, how does that sound to you? I'm very curious to hear your comments. Well, of course, I completely agree with you. Um, and I particularly like your emphasis on the perspective uh, from Gaia's point of view. Because, you know, as you know, uh, viruses are incredibly important um, in Gaia, and they have been from the very beginning of life. I mean, every day uh, we have about 800 million viruses falling out of the sky onto every square meter of the Earth's surface. There are viruses floating around in the atmosphere, everywhere floating around in the atmosphere. They get sucked up in air currents and they move all over the planet. And so, where do they come from? Well, they, they come, I mean, they're, 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 they're reproducing in bacteria, in ourselves, in all, in all organisms. Um, and they've been evolving and evolving for thousands of millions of years, mm -hmm. probably before bacteria appeared. So they are, they are the most abundant entities on the planet by far. I mean, you might have, say, millions of bacteria in a small space, but you'll have hundreds of millions of viruses in, a, in the same space. Um, mm -hmm. And also, um, they, they have a central role in the ecology of, of the planet. They modulate the function and evolution of all living things. Um, for example, in the ocean, you know, there are, there are bacteria and uh, plankton that are absorbing CO2. Well, viruses infect them, and by killing bacteria, they liberate nutrients into the, into the, into the system, which allows further bacteria to grow and to suck out CO2 from the atmosphere. So um, they're, they're very important in regulating uh, the ecology of the planet. Now, Stefan, that reminds me of genetic engineering, where viruses are used as vectors to modify DNA. Is there a corresponding natural process that does that? Yeah, absolutely. There's, that's what they do. One thing they do is they move DNA from one organism to another. In fact, a lot of the DNA in our nervous systems has come from, from viruses. Mm -hmm. um, the viral DNA has been found recently is incredibly important in helping our neurons to communicate with each other. You know, viral DNA, DNA from viruses. So mm -hmm. 
they're very important as natural genetic engineers, if you like, as well as ecological regulators. And I think what the COVID virus is teaching us is that um, you know, about Gaia and self-regulation, it's a mess, as you said, it's a message from Gaia. And what Gaia is teaching us is how she regulates things with using viruses. And now she's regulating us, just like viruses regulate the populations of bacteria in the ocean and in the soil and in our guts. So, it, so now that we've become out of control as humans, viruses are now starting to control us. And we yeah. really need to learn that lesson from Gaia. And, and it's really amazing that, that when you look at the major infection herds, uh, as, as the pandemic started in January, February, you can see they often occur in situations which shouldn't exist in the first place, which are unhealthy and unjust in the first place, like these giant meatpacking factories or, or these giant cruise ships and things like that. So yeah, it's... It... Exactly. I mean, in a natural ecosystem, what will happen is you may get some, say, a bacteria in the ocean that's become way too abundant. Or, for example, an algal bloom, a toxic algal bloom mm -hmm. that's doing huge damage to the local ecology in the ocean. Well, how is that regulated? By viruses. Viruses come along and they infect those um, bacteria or those algae in the algal bloom and they crash the population of the, of the algal bloom and they, they save the system for, for, for the whole. And in that sense, we're no different to an algal bloom, a toxic algal bloom. We're a kind yeah. of toxic human economic growth bloom that the vet yeah, yeah. is about controlling. It's also interesting that, that in, in previous years and in previous decades, uh, people were afraid of bacteria and they thought, you know, bacteria are dangerous, they do a lot of harm. And, you know, scientists like Lynn Margulis, whom we both knew well, uh, showed us that most of what bacteria uh, do is, is life enhancing and life preserving. And now what you are saying is the same is true for viruses, which uh, in many ways I think people are even more afraid of than nowadays than, than of bacteria. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're quite right. We, now we, we should be talking about the virusphere, you know, we know the biosphere. Now we think about the virus fear. There is a virus fear. I mean, it's, it's, it's hugely important. And mm -hmm. our consciousness needs to focus on, it's interesting, we need to focus on the smallest semi-biological entities so that we can get a more global guy and understanding of our place in nature. It's like the smallest biological entities teaching us about the big scale planetary situation. Yes. So, so what do you see uh, in the UK and from your point of view, uh, how do you assess the chances of really making changes, not going back to normal because normal has been the problem, yeah. but, but really making changes? Yeah, well, it's very interesting, you know, as someone commented on the chat just now, here in Britain, Boris Johnson and his cronies are trying to get back to normal as quickly as possible. The thing yeah. is that the virus won't allow it because yes. as soon as we start getting back to normal and start, you know, economic growth as before, the virus will come back and will regulate our, our numbers. So we'll be forced to lock down again. And there'll be waves of lockdown and waves of, of normality, semi-normality, until we finally learn the lesson that we cannot keep living like this. So yes. the um, virus is a great guy and teacher, I think. Yeah, it also, it also teaches us social responsibility. And as I said in my talk, you know, behavior for the common good. What, what we are observing here in the United States is that cert, in certain states or in certain regions, people are socially responsible and they are opening up businesses, but carefully and with circumspection. Whereas in others, people don't care and they say, nobody's going to tell me what I have to do. And, and this is where the infections are arising. We're seeing spikes in, in various states where people are just irresponsible. And uh, I'm afraid it, it will go on for a long time here because, uh, uh, you know, the um, American tradition is this so-called rugged individualism and not social responsibility. Now, it doesn't mean that there are not many people who are very responsible in this country, but others are not. And so it's, it's uh, worrisome. Yeah, I mean, I think in a sense, Gaia, so to speak, couldn't have designed a, a better virus to teach us a lesson. Um, this lesson of social and ecological responsibility, 
and yes, also yes. very good timing you know it happened just before the climate crisis was going to get really serious and probably irreversible yes covid came along just before probably just before that moment of irreversibility and climate change so that we have a chance to learn our lessons and we're, we're being we'll be forced to learn the lessons you know once climate change becomes serious it's irreversible whereas yeah. now with covid we have a chance to to change our ways completely before the climate crisis becomes really right. serious yeah. uh, that that reminds me of of something i mentioned in my talk you know planting trees Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you have seen this study from the Swiss Polytechnic University, uh, Tom Crowther, about, uh, about tree planting. Have you seen that? Yes, I have. Yeah, but please yeah, go. That was in science. Let, let me just mention this to, to our listeners, that yeah. this is uh, uh, a young uh, ecologist at the University of Zurich, the famous ETH, or ETH in German, and uh, he has a lab of young scientists of maybe two dozen called the Crowther Lab. And they do really exciting projects. And what they did was they took 80,000 pictures of the earth from Google Maps and they made a study of where we could plant trees without disturbing human habitat, agricultural land, and so on. And they found that 1.7 billion trees, uh, no, 1.7 billion of hectares mm -hmm. would be available and 1.2 trillion trees could be planted. Mm -hmm. And they, this is not just a general study, but very specifically, they found which trees should be planted where, because of course not all trees grow everywhere, and then they estimated the CO2 that would be removed from the atmosphere if we planted all these trees. And they found that two thirds of all emissions humanity has made would be uh, recovered and, and drawn down from the atmosphere. So they conclude that planting trees is by far the cheapest and the most effective way of, of combating the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very excited about this because this is something that should be introduced into all schools, government programs, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important. And also in places where we, where we grow food, where we're not going to plant trees, it's very important to grow food, as you said, Fritjof, in, in ecological ways, you know, using permaculture techniques that will also extract large amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. So we, yes. we have to abandon this sort of industrial scale agriculture and move towards much more permaculture, locally based, biodiverse forms of food production that yes. will also remove CO2 from and, the and, and in terms of organization and activism, we have to join the, uh, you know, the food and health movement and the climate movement and those those two forms of activism are still largely separated mm -hmm. so there there are many organizations who are very efficient in lobbying for you know climate policies and you know demonstrating against pipelines and things like that and uh, they don't talk about agriculture and then there are many people doing permaculture, agroecology, regenerative agriculture, and all these uh, varieties, and uh, they don't talk about climate change. I mean, it's beginning now to, to be joined, but this is something uh, we really have to work on. And this yeah. is something maybe you, should, you could do at Schumacher College, you know, uh, design a course that addresses both agriculture and climate change. Maybe you have done that already. No, we talk about that a lot. I think that's a good idea. And also, of course, the virus is forcing us to, to think systemically, as you're showing in your talk. Yeah. It forces us to think in a, from, a, from a Gaian point of view. I think yeah. what we really need to do as, as, a, as a humanity is not only see things from our own human point of view, but see them from Gaia's point of view. We all need to have Gaia glasses, if you like. Yes. so that we can understand things from the planet's point of view because of course if the planet isn't healthy there's no way that we are going to be healthy yes. as the virus has shown us yeah. and of course thinking systemically is necessary as we have often discussed at schumacher college 
uh, whenever you look at nature, you know, whether it's a forest or whether it's a, a, a wetland or, or whether it's the Gaia system at large, you can only understand it by thinking in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns. But now the virus tells us, well, you better really do it or else, you know? Yeah, that's Again, right. it's the question of life and death. Yeah, because now we're realizing that we too are subject to Gaian self-regulation mechanisms, to put it like that. We're not immune from Gaia's feedbacks. You know, the climate feedbacks are a bit hard to understand. They, they'll come in 20, 30 years, too far in the future. We're right in the thick right now with the virus. We're in the thick of a Gaian, a very powerful Gaian feedback. So it's a great opportunity for us to learn and to feel connected with Gaia. I think the virus, as you said, I think is, is Gaia's teaching. He's, people have asked me, what, what do you think Gaia is doing with the virus? Is it revenge? Is it punishment? Is it anything like that? I say, no, she's teaching us. She's giving us one last chance to learn the lessons we've been discussing before the climate tips into unstoppable climate change. This is our yeah. last chance. So in a way, she's being very kind to us, being like a very, like, a, like Lynn Margulis used to say, you know, Gaia is one tough bitch, right? Yeah. So she's being, she's being a tough bitch sending us this virus, but, but it's for our own good, ultimately, despite yeah. all, all the, all the tra human tragedies that you've mentioned, which were terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, if if we can listen and if we can act accordingly. If we can listen, yes. But I don't think we're going to listen to, uh, certainly in Britain, our government is not listening. You know, they want, they, like some of the places in the States you mentioned, they want to go back to normality. The good thing, the interesting thing is the, the virus won't let us go back to normality. Yeah. Because yeah. as you mentioned, there'll be spikes again and we'll have to lock down again and there'll be cycles of lockdown and not lock until we finally learn the lesson. Yes. Well, shall we see what uh, what happened in the chat box? I yes, think, uh, that's a good time. Yes, let's do Tim that. And, uh, uh, Thanks. Is, Thank you very much. Um, a really interesting and exciting talk and, and an awful lot of chat going on and lots of questions. And I think I'd encourage anybody who's, who's put uh, words in the chat box, but perhaps hasn't put them in the question box to perhaps move some of them over into a question. And I'll try and run through some of them um, uh, and we probably won't be able to cover everything, but let's let's see where we get to. So, so Gunter asks: the COVID nineteen pandemic has only created greater urgency that we're longing for a new aspirational project, a new collective narrative that can help us overcome social and political polarization, and unite us in building a better future after the crisis. What might that narrative look like, and who are the players and stakeholders? Well, I think the narrative has to be Gaian. Gaia has to come to the fore of our consciousness. We have to stop being anti-Gaia and we have to become pro-Gaia. We have to understand that we're, we, as David Abraham would say, that we live inside this gigantic round sentient creature known as Gaia. Just like microbes live in our guts, so do we live deep inside the bowels of this fantastic planet, Gaia. And everyone needs to have a Gaian consciousness. So I would say we need to move from a, a purely pro-human anthropocentric consciousness to a Gaian consciousness. Uh, and Gaia is the big idea for the 21st century. This is what uh, Mary Midgley said about a great British philosopher. I think mm. Gaia is, could be a unifying concept. After all, we all share the same atmosphere. We all share the same water. Gaia unites us all, irrespective of our, our politics, our religion, our race, our color. Gaia unites us all. So I would, urge us, I would urge us all to adopt Gaia as the central organizing idea for our times. Yeah, I, I agree. So at, at the deepest level, we need this change of awareness, this change of consciousness. Now, once we have made that, then the question is, still remains, you know, how do we act differently? How do we organize ourselves differently? And this is where we need systemic thinking. And this is what you know I've been working on for the last 30 years. And I just want to show you uh, the cover of this textbook that Tim uh, men mentioned, The Systems View of Life. And I want to show it because it has this beautiful iconic sculpture of Andy Goldsworthy in front, this network of twigs being reflected in a lake. 
which to me is very symbolic because it, it shows us life as a network and also arising out of the water as we know life did in evolution. So this kind of thinking is what we need. Yeah, you know? and I would just add that thinking is very important, but we need more than thinking now. We need feeling. Absolutely. We don't, we don't feel enough love. We need love for Gaia. We need to fall in love with Gaia. And the thinking can help us. I mean, book, books like Fritjof's books can help us become amazed by Gaia or Lovelock's books and other books. But it's, it's really a question of feeling, of love. We don't yeah. love Gaia. We feel she's our enemy or just a resource we have to exploit. We wouldn't treat a person like that. And Gaia is a great person, the person that gave us birth. We have to love her and respect her. Yeah, and it absolutely is a time for action, isn't it? I think that's one of the things behind the kind of key theme for, for this series is, is we can't allow ourselves to drift back to the same. How do we uh, take advantage of that opportunity? Uh, Lerenka Bustani asks, there are several traditions that speak to the notion of dying before you die referring to the individual process of ego dissolution, quite typical in near-death experiences through which life's uh, real meaning can finally be understood and appreciated. For those of us lucky enough to still be around, is COVID-19 the singular opportunity for us to die before we die? <laughs> well, I, I would say so. I mean, we need to die from an anti-Gaia, egocentric perspective, which we have in our culture, it's mainstream in our culture, to a pro-Gaian, um, ecological perspective in which your ego does dissolve it's almost as if the virus you know is, is that's what viruses do to bacteria they enter the cells they burst the cells open we need to have the virus burst our ego cell open if you like so we can fall in love with God so we can understand that we're living inside this planet yeah mm. and Fritjof did you have anything else to oh, oh nothing to add no, no, no. So, um, uh, Rianne Hall asks, what do Fritjof and Stefan think about the race to create a vaccination for the virus, given their views that the virus serves a vital purpose? And there's a lesson from Gaia. And interestingly, last week we had Charles Eisenstein on, and one of the things he was talking about was the sense that in some ways uh, viruses quite often were a download of the information that we needed. It was our means almost of evolving. Um, and was there a kind of danger almost of us hiding from this thing, of us not as a society um, being more broadly exposed to it? Uh, was there a danger that we were going to miss this download and therefore be weaker going forward? The thing is, well, I, don't think, yeah. I don't think that finding a vaccine uh, will change the fact that our lives have been seriously disrupted around the world and the lessons are there for everyone to see. And uh, we, will, we will be able to, to heed them and change our ways of life easier if we overcome the crisis. Uh, I, I, am not, uh, I have not decided personally, you know, how to, how to respond to a vaccine. Uh, it will depend on what kind how long did it take to develop? How carefully was the research? Do we know about the side effects and so on? But I'm certainly not against vaccines. No, I mean, my view is that we, we, may, we may get a vaccine. It, it may not be easy, but if, if we do get a vaccine, I'd be happy, of course, to have one. But because we've destroyed habitats so much and because um, we're creating perfect conditions for new viruses and new diseases to emerge, there will be another one sooner or later. Yes. And once we get a vaccine for that one, if we do, there'll be another one after that. In other words, Gaius is going to hit us with this lesson over and over again. The more we destroy wild habitats and the more contact we have with wild animals, etc., the more factory farming we do, you know, with intensive farming of, of, of livestock, the more of these viruses are going to come and get us. And event, it'll be an arms race between us and the viruses. And the viruses are much smarter and quicker than we are. And we won't be able to keep up with our vaccine production. In the end, you know, we'll, we'll just fall down on our knees and, and beg Gaia. And, I mean, it's the, same, it's the same issue as with medicine in general, that we can't <coughs> just treat the symptoms, we need to treat the underlying causes. And it's exactly the same here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we better learn the lesson now with this, with this virus. If we have a vaccine, great. But we should learn the lessons, as Fritjof said, and, and stop destroying Gaia yeah. and habitat. No, that's great. Thank you. 
I, I suppose one of the questions for me is if in this um, conversation, I think we are definitely part of a bubble that, that doesn't necessarily include everybody out there in, in our community. And one of the questions from Arthur Pays was about um, uh, effectively Emmanuel Macron, uh, president of France's organized civic convention on climate with 150 members of civic society have independently drafted a host of proposals to lower emissions, reply to ecological imperatives and diminish social inequality. However, Macron has decided to leave it up to Parliament to discuss whether or not to transcribe these proposals into law. It was an interesting experience because civic society seemed to have taken measures um, of the impending and current problems. But now that the fruit of their work will be discussed to death by politicians with very strong ties to corporate France, I suppose my, my sense is how do we break out of the bubble we're in? How do we get this message to a broader community and, and, well, and use I'm... this opportunity to make it stick? I'm, I'm very interested. I didn't know about this development in France, but I have uh, tried for decades to uh, promote the idea that uh, government, civil society and business, the three centers of power in our society, need to work together to overcome our multifaceted crisis. And I remember about 10 years ago, during the Obama administration, I was invited to Washington DC to discuss in a small group, to discuss policy making in a networked world. And that's where I lobbied for a, a kind of department, you know, at cabinet, a cabinet level position that would uh, uh, serve as a, a link between civil society and government but it didn't go anywhere in the Obama administration, nor anywhere else. I have brought this forth with politicians again and again. So I'm, I'm very glad to hear that Macron in France at least tried. And, you know, of course, politics being politics, it, it may be talked to death, but maybe not. Maybe something will come out. Yeah, perhaps this virus is the thing it needs in order to get it to the agenda to move forward. I was interested, um, Erica Lewis has written that um, many argue that rewilding re rather than tree planting sequesters carbon faster. In other words, leaving it to Gaia rather than necessarily the tree planting uh, activity you were talking about before. And, and she was interested in what your thoughts were about that. Well, I think this study that was done in Switzerland is, is the answer. And, and uh, you know, I, would, I don't know how to communicate with our audience, but I would be happy, Tim, to send you the link to actually a report that appeared in The Guardian in the UK a while ago about this study. Great. And, and in fact, I think, uh, Fritjof, somebody's already put it in the chat, so anybody oh. who wants to see it can see it there. <laughs> but we can make sure when this film um, it goes live as well, we can, we'll, we'll put the link uh, down. Yeah, so, so the study really contains the answer because they did very detailed research about how much CO2 would be drawn down, where, where is it most effective, which trees are most effective, and so on. About rewilding, I think uh, in some areas, you know, which are very degraded, Gaia's gonna need some help to, uh, for, to, for rewilding, for, re for restoration. And I think that's where we can, we can help the, the restoration process by planting trees and, and suitable vegetation. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Carlotta Manzoni, and I think it's a similar sort of question in some ways, is asking about um, what opportunities do you see for exploiting the circular and regenerative principles for the recovery post-COVID, especially with respect to the potential to create new jobs? Well, uh, what, uh, what I see as the most uh, developed idea is the idea of the Green New Deal, that uh, was developed in several countries here in, in the US by Bernie Sanders and uh, our new political star, the young Congresswoman AOC, which stands for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And the Green New Deal is the basic idea of very strict environmental regulations, shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources and other kinds of uh, uh, environmentally responsible uh, new arrangements, all of which are very labor intensive and therefore will create massive jobs. So the Green New Deal at this is a true systemic solution. 
you know, <clears throat> contributing to uh, dealing with the climate crisis and with social inequality and economic inequality, the two major problems of our time. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm just looking, Jenny Finn, um, I'm the <coughs> co-founder of a learning community or school and I'm articulating educational design rooted in living systems principles. So what guidance or wisdom can you offer in this arena? Uh, maybe something uh, we should be uh, considering at this time and it's clearly that's in an early setup stage I think. Well this, this is, this is uh, an easy answer for us and, and almost sounds like a planted question. Uh, I've worked for over 10 years in primary education with the Centre for Eco-Literacy which I co-founded in Berkeley and we have abundant literature uh, you know, curriculum materials, books, all kinds of things to, to teach ecology in an hands-on experiential way, to teach it systemically and so on. So that goes from kindergarten to 12th grade in the American system. And then, of course, in, in higher education, you know, I would hand it over to Stefan to talk about the courses that, that he and Brian Goodwin and others have created at Schumacher College. Well, one thing I would recommend is to do something that Sergio Marishin and I created. Sergio is one of our master students in holistic science. We call it the deep time walk. And we have an app that you can download to do the deep time walk. And it gives us people a sense of the immense age of the earth and the incredible history of the earth. And it really helps you to connect through walking uh, with the life of our planet. And it helps you to understand that we are part of Gaian feedbacks. We can't separate ourselves from Gaia's, Gaian feedbacks. And in this walk, uh, every millimeter you walk is a thousand years of Gaia's history. Every millimeter is a, is a thousand years. Every meter is a million years. If you actually walk with your own body through the Gaia's deep time, you have a deep experience of being connected to Gaia. And I think that's very important. You see, the education has to be deeply experiential. It's not good enough just sitting in a classroom and talking about it. You've got to experience Gaia. And doing the deep time walk is a really great way of doing it. I mean, we've discovered this is very, very effective. So I, I would recommend to our panelists that she, that she downloads the app and she, she tries it out with her students. Great. Well, Stefan, I can tell you that uh, in my Capra course, I now have study groups, you know, and, and groups that, that uh, register for the course as a group and then have discussion sessions. And one such group was in Florida, 40 people, uh, and they took the deep time walk. And, and this was before the, the lockdown. So uh -huh. it's, it's being practiced also here. That's yeah, okay. great. Yes, it's very, very effective. So I would recommend that. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, both of you. And Jenny has corrected me. I think she's in the seventh year of, start, of starting the school as secondary school. So mm -hmm. I apologise that I was suggesting it was younger than that. Um, there are two very similar questions here, I think, which, which um, are really cut up to the root of how do we communicate this. So um, Hetty Einzig is saying, how do we take these messages out into the mainstream using a language that bridge to mainstream language? The guy in consciousness doesn't speak to the great mass of people. How can government think tanks, for example, be persuaded to adopt this consciousness and systemic thinking? And then Gunter as well has said, um, uh, we all here in this call do all know about the idea, but how do we translate a Gaian consciousness to the public, to businesses, to education? And I think um, I'd, I would agree with both of those. I think what you're saying works incredibly well in this context, but I'm not sure how many people, if you stopped them on the street, they would immediately engage with with your vision? Well, I think uh, what we are both doing, uh, Stefan and I, and you know, Schumacher College in, as, as a whole, and my Capra course, is to build up a network of uh, people with an ecological consciousness, people who are systemic thinkers and activists. I have taught this course now for four years, and I have an alumni network of about 1,500 people around the world. And Schumacher College has an alumni network that is much larger. And so this has to grow organically. 
people will change their lives. They will talk to their family, to their friend, to their business colleagues, and it has to grow like this. Very often people say, uh, you know, uh, I can talk with you and with my fellow course participants about that, but at work I can't. Mm. And then I encourage them to open a space at work, like a lunch meeting or a chat box or something like this. And then they very often discover that among, say, 50 employees, 10 of them think the same. Well, I can't talk about this at work. And then this, they discover each other. So I think it has to grow organically. That's the only way. Also, I think if you talk to, say, a politician or an economist, they understand the notion of feedback when applied to business or to economics. And now the virus gives us a great opportunity to explain to them that feedback also applies to, to us ecologically from a planetary point of view. So I think the, the virus gives us an opening to discuss <clears throat> feedback, not just on the economic level, but also on the, on the ecological planetary level. Great. Yes. Thank you, Stefan. No, I think that, that's, that for me really, really works. Um, Anthony Lamport has asked, would the sense of your words shift if you, if you accepted for a moment that we are an expression of Gaia always? We are not in this alien being called Gaia. Was Gaia stupid in creating humans? No, not at all. I mean, uh, Gaia, I think, <coughs> needs, needs our consciousness. Um, and we're not alien. I mean, Gaia is not alien. I mean, Gaia, Gaia to, to put it poetically, Gaia is our mother. I mean, how can your mother be alien to you? I mean, she is. Scientifically, we can make the case that Gaia is our mother. It's a more poetic way of putting it. Of course, of course, when she's not alien to us, she's our mother. And um, our consciousness is deeply part of Gaia. You could say, if you want to be teleological about it, Gaia needs our consciousness for some reason. Maybe Gaia needs our consciousness so she can see herself through our eyes, through, through our science. She can see herself and see who she is. So we are deeply part of Gaia. She's not alien and we're not alien. We're like, Gaia and, our, and us are like this, just like every other organism. Yeah, thank you. Now, as someone just said, um, <laughs> humans are a mistake. We're not a mistake. No, no species <laughs> is a mistake. We're all yeah. welcome. We're all part of Gaia. Lynn Margulis used to say, as a joke, human, you know, a pox called man. A pox called man. I mean, I, I didn't agree with it. It's not, not humans that are a pox. It's this sort of idea that we can grow the economy endlessly. That's, that's the virus. That's the pox. It's not humans no. as much. It's, it's our worldview that's a pox. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's great. Leslie Whitaker asks a kind of question which leads directly on from that as well, I think. So I've wondered whether climate change is Gaia's fever response to the infection of Homo sapiens in their system. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is a very moving idea. When you think of it, uh, you could say that at the moment Gaia is sick. Mm. She has a fever and she has trouble breathing because we're cutting down the rainforest. The, her lungs mm -hmm. and those are exactly the symptoms of COVID-19. Yeah yeah Gaia, Gaia which, she has a fever and the fever is not due to humanity it's, it's due to our western worldview to put it like that you know our lust for economic growth that's that's the reason we have the fever. Um, it's a worldview fever it's not a fever due to humans but we can cure that we can change our worldview quite easily really which it just needs that dawning of understanding in people's minds, which the virus might be able to help us bring about. Mm -hmm. There are so many questions here and, and it would be brilliant to go through them all. And I hope we will catch some of the, the um, uh, points that people are bringing up and also some of the connections. And we'll, we'll try to put some of those in the, in the film, but perhaps we, we have just a sort of a minute to go, but it would be, I would be very happy for it to run over a little bit. But Simon asks, and I'm just trying to find his uh, question again, which is a really simple question, but I think um, uh, it might be a great place for us to finish, about what gives you most hope at this moment? And maybe we could hear from both of you in relation to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to go first. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, the the one of the key lessons of uh, systems thinking in general is to realize that uh, our major problems 
how major global problems are all interrelated. So whether we talk about energy, the environment, climate change, social inequality, violence and war, and now the COVID pandemic, those are systemic problems, which means they're all interrelated and interdependent, and they need corresponding systemic solutions. To find these solutions and apply them, you need to be able to think in terms of relationships and patterns, in one word, in terms of networks. Now, what gives me the greatest hope is that our youth, people who are now, you know, young people who are between 15 and 25, they have grown up in networks because they live in social networks. Mm -hmm. And this network thinking, in other words, systemic thinking is second nature to them. And that gives me a lot of hope. Mm. That's very interesting. You see, I would go to the opposite function to thinking, which is <clears throat> feeling, to complement what Fritjof has said. I mean, I'm a scientist who talk about thinking, but Fritjof has done that very well. So what, what gives me hope is that where every single human being has the capacity to feel the value of Gaia, to fall in love with Gaia, to wake up one morning and feel the beauty of the sky and the, feel the beauty of the, of the plants and the birds and the animals, Every single human being has that capacity. Uh, it's, it's given to us from our birth, this, this ability to perceive Gaia and fall in love with Gaia and be inspired by Gaia. So it gives me hope that it's always possible to reach that in people. And you see, that way we can put together the systemic thinking of, of that Fritjof talks about, which is so important, with the opposite function, as Jung would say, which is our feeling and our sensing and our intuition. So uh, what gives me hope is that every human being has the capacity to be whole and to be pro gaian We just need to foster that relationship with our planet. Great, thank you so much. I think there we probably do need to draw it to a conclusion. It's been an absolutely fascinating evening and, and thank you so much for, for all of your thoughts and wisdom. Um, all right, thank you. Goodbye, thank everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye, um, thank you, everyone. Lovely to be with you. Bye-bye. Um, I'd like to thank all of you as well again for joining us tonight for supporting the work of Schumacher College. We have four further talks in this series and next week we have Oh Brave New World that has such people in it with Margaret Wheatley uh, which I think is going to be great so I hope you'll be able to uh, and want to attend that and we had lots of conversations this evening about um, uh, agriculture and so on and again uh, Rupert Sheldrake is talking in, in a few weeks so I hope you'll want to talk to that one. I hope that Fritjof and Stephen's talk and conversation has whetted your appetite, in which case I'd point you towards Fritjof's excellent books, as well as the Capra course, which you can find online. We also have a number of short courses and MA programmes at Schumacher College, which deal with very similar themes, most notably our MA in Engaged Ecology and Holistic Science, but we have other programmes as well. So do please look at the website, subscribe to our mailing lists and follow us on Twitter for information on courses and future events. This has been our eighth online Earth Talk and we would love to have your feedback on how we can continue to improve. And again, I apologise that we haven't managed to um, uh, uh, use everyone's questions and have a chance to put them. Um, but we would also love to hear about the issues, topics, speakers that you would like to see in the future. So please do give us that feedback. So can I thank you all again for your very active participation. The chat box has been going completely mad this evening and the questions were brilliant. And thank you again, um, Stefan Harding and Fritjof Capra. Thank you all very much and good night. <laughs>